Um, let me uh, read your bio. Let me read your bio here, Josh. Uh, Josh Thomas is a principal planner with the Delaware Office of State Planning Coordination, where he is responsible for the coordination of land use planning in Kent County. This includes implementing the state strategies for policies and spending, coordinating plan reviews in the preliminary land use service, and coordinating the comprehensive plans for 21 local governments. Prior to OSPC, Josh spent nearly 14 years with the Delaware Department of Transportation Division, Delaware Department of Transportation Division of Planning, where he was responsible for long-range transportation planning and programming. Josh is an AICP certified planner. He is also proud to serve as president of the Delaware chapter of the American Planning Association. Thanks, Josh, over to you. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, Laura, for that, uh, for that introduction. Um, and and uh, on behalf of the Delaware chapter of the APA, I just wanna thank all of you for, for joining us today during your lunch hour. And, um, and don't worry if we call on you and your camera's off or there's a delay to unmute, it's okay. We know you just you know took a big bite of your sandwich or something. So, <laughs> um, so thank you for taking the time to be with us. And uh, we really uh, thank the, the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration for allowing uh, Delaware to host the webinar today. Uh, but I really wanna note that this is definitely a collaborative effort. Um, several of the folks online today played integral roles in getting all the pieces of the puzzle to fit together. So this is really um, a, a joint effort. And I really can't say enough about the, the Mid-Atlantic collaboration. Um, in my role with the Delaware chapter, this has been a great resource for us. And it you know, really started during the pandemic when we, we had to learn how to connect better in, in the digital space. And, and through this effort, I really have met the greatest people and it, it, it allows all the different chapters to expand their reach. And um, it's, you know, for, for a webinar that our chapter would have run, um, you know, during a lunch hour, we wouldn't have nearly as many attendees as we have right now. So that's just fantastic. We've got attendees up and down the East Coast. Um, so I really just wanna um, thank that collaboration for, for helping us expand our reach. And, um, and because of this reach, I do wanna just take a brief minute to promote our chapter's uh, upcoming virtual fall conference. And um, that will be on October 5th and October 6th. Um, we, we just closed our, our call for abstracts. We are reviewing all of them now and, and they look excellent. Um, so I would just encourage you to watch the, the Delaware APA website for updates. And if you'd like to learn more about our chapter's events, uh, please join our mailing list, which can also be done from our, from our website. Um, DelawareAPA.org, and I can put that in the chat. Um, we'll only bug you with about two emails a month, so it's not that many. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, I'm going to uh, keep my, my introductions uh, short and sweet. I want to make sure we have time for all of our panelists today. Um, so I am happy to kick off our panel discussion, and our speakers, uh, myself included, will be discussing a, a variety of tools and resources that we use um, in our individual organizations and kind of collectively to protect the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So a pretty simple format, I'm gonna introduce each of the panel members. Um, each panelist is gonna give a brief talk and then um, like, uh, like our hosts have, have mentioned, we're gonna have a QA and a session at the end. Um, I do believe though, if you put your questions in Q&A, um, you know, we can uh, try to answer some questions live as well, just to make sure we get everyone's questions answered. So we are we are actually a little bit ahead of schedule, so we'll get going. And I uh, had the pleasure of introducing uh, Casey Filipino, uh, who's gonna be talking about land use and water, um, land use and water quality in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Casey is a senior water resources planner at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. She is a native of Pennsylvania received an undergrad degree in Delaware, and now resides in Norfolk, Virginia, after receiving her PhD in oceanography at Old Dominion University. At HRPDC, she monitors Chesapeake Bay program developments and TMDL implementation for the member localities within the Bay watershed. She is very involved in the Bay, in the Bay program's partnership as a member of several work groups and a co-chair to, to the land use work group. 
So I want to um, thank you, Casey, and you should be able to share your screen and get started. All right, are we good? We're good. We hear you loud and clear. Awesome. Thanks. Um, great. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, it, it's really nice being a part of these kinds of conversations because um, and having everybody in the whole watershed here because I um, I'm a native of Pennsylvania. And so I saw somebody here from where I grew up, Susquehanna Township, and somebody from where I'm living right now in Norfolk, Virginia. So it's just so nice to see this broad um, watershed scale um, conversation happening right now. Um, so I'm just going to be really brief today, but I'm going to talk a little bit about land use and water quality in the Chesapeake Bay watershed um, and how all of those pieces fit together. Um, I'm going to be giving, I'm going to try to set the stage today with uh, talking about four big topics. I'd really like to spend more time on every single one of these uh, topics individually, but that's kind of tricky to do uh, in, in this time frame. So just bear with me if some of this is new to you or you're not familiar with it all, um, or if you're outside of the watershed, I can understand that. Um, but I think that I'm going to try to, to touch on each one of these as, as best I can, give you the information so you can um, get some of these resources yourself. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about water quality and land use planning um, and how those interrelate, um, then how all of that feeds into the Chesapeake Bay TMDL and uh, how that Bay TMDL is created with a variety of models, including um, land use and loadings um, in terms of nutrients from the land uses. And I'm going to introduce the very brand new data set um, that hopefully some of you are aware of from the land use work group and from the Chesapeake Bay program, USGS and the Chesapeake Conservancy with our new high res land use um, data set and how that data can then be used uh, for, for your purposes. So very um, briefly, obviously we know um, that what happens on the land impacts our waters. Uh, we do know that when it rains and water hits impervious surfaces or structures or lawns, uh, it brings with it whatever's on those landscapes, uh, whether it's nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus and sediment that's particular to the Bay TMDL or other pollutants, um, we know that all of that, that stuff, those pollutants are, are getting into our local waterways through the storm drains, the gutters, or directly impacting um, our rivers. Um, we also know uh, that impervious services generate more runoff. Uh, when you have a lot of runoff, this can cause increased erosion, less infiltration, so less ability for anything like vegetation or trees or plants to remove those pollutants from the water um, and treat them appropriately. And that, of course, then introduces pollutions. I really like this infographic here because um, it, it, it's a nice segue of what happens when we have natural ground, co ground cover and vegetated cover. Um, you know, we have less runoff, more infiltration, more evapotranspiration. Um, and then as you transition into increasing those areas with impervious surfaces, of course, you're going to increase the runoff and decrease infiltration. So it's just a nice way to, to say, you know, what, what we put on the landscape is really going to impact. Um, our waterways, and that leads to water quality and water quality impairments. Um, I, this is a map of our region down in Hampton Roads in Virginia, and the yellow um, is an impairment of uh, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Those are, those are what we deal with in terms of dealing with the, the pollution diet for the Chesapeake Bay, um, and that's the impairment for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, and we have other impairments as well, just like most um, regions in the Bay watershed, you know, are going to have maps that look like this. And this nice, this is a nice infographic that um, lives on askhrgreen.org, uh, which is our environmental education arm at HRPDC. And it kind of shows you where the, some of these pollutants are coming from and, and what they can, how they can harm our region. Of course, as I mentioned, runoff increases nutrients or other pollutants and leads to impair waterways. You can have increased algae blooms. With those increased algae blooms, when they decay, you have lower dissolved oxygen within the water. Um, and then these impairments can then lead to total maximum daily loads. So those, that's where we come into the Bay TMDL. And I know that this, this group has been talking about the Bay TMDL as a whole, and this is the end of that. So I'm not gonna belabor um, the point about the Bay TMDL, just to note that it is a pollution diet, of course, to, to decrease the source loads from the land. And it's an iterative process and it's been going on for a long time um, within the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership where all the partners are, are doing water quality monitoring and assessments to see how the water's doing. Do we have higher low DO? What are our impairments? And then there's a suite of models that model the loading rates and estuarine processes. So the loading rates from the landscape 
and then how those enter into the estuary and what those processes are and how that impacts our the bay itself. Um, and then partners and jurisdictions, local, federal, state, um, they all try to implement best ma management practices and policies. And so implementing those will help reduce nutrients from the landscape, from wastewater treatment plants, um, you know, reduce what's happening from atmospheric deposition, et cetera. And then all of that gets back into this feedback loop and evaluated again into modeled results. This is a loop that just keeps going throughout the Bay Program Partnership. Um, and that I think is kind of in a nutshell how this all works, where we're monitoring and assessing and implementing and, and always trying to see how we're doing um, to achieve the goal by 2025. Um, so as I mentioned, land use or the, um, the Chesapeake Bay is a suite of models. And what I wanna just kind of show you today is the connection between land use in the Chesapeake Bay watershed model and how that's impacting you know, our, your local waterways in the Bay as a whole. So we have the suite of models is what they call it. The phase six is the watershed model. And that's built with a lot of different inputs. Um, we've got all kinds of data going into it. And one of the major backbones of that of those data sources is the land use data. And as a chair of the land use work group, that's where we help um, the Chesapeake Conservancy, the USGS, the Chesapeake Bay Program, and all the other partners get the best data available to put into that model. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a minute. Um, but that watershed model feeds the estuary model, which tells us actually how we're doing within the water column itself. You know, What is our dissolved oxygen looking like in comparison to those monitored data points? So it's connecting the model loads to the measured water quality endpoints. And again, those model loads are a combination of point and non-point sources and atmospheric deposition. And the non-point sources are generally based on land use. Um, and that's, that's, like I said, the fundamental, the fundamental backbone of, of the watershed model. There's also a land use change model that fits into all of this. That model helps um, the Bay program assess how we're going in time and how we're gonna meet the goals in 2025. So essentially it's assessing growth um, and, and predicting where they think uh, growth is going to occur throughout the model shed. And you can, you know, jurisdictions have been tasked in the past to actually say, I'm gonna do this certain land use planning exercise and it will be put in to land use change model. And let's see if that actually helps with the loads or the pollutions um, uh, within the estuary itself. So there's a lot that goes on with all of these models. Um, and the major focus of course today is land use. And as I mentioned, um, land use data is really key to that model. Um, in historically, uh, the most recent high resolution data set was implemented in about 2016, and that was based on 2013 imagery. And it was high resolution, it was really good data, um, and it had a lot of classification schemas in it. Um, and that was the best data at the time. And that was put into the suite of models, it's called the, um, CAST is the, the big term for all the models together, the Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool. Um, and prior to 2013, the data was a little bit coarser. It was at 30 meter scale, I believe it was based on NLCD. So all of that um, data has been improved upon iteratively over the years. Now, fast forward to 2018, Chesapeake Bay Program, EPA, um, put forth a cooperative agreement with the Chesapeake Conservancy, that, and it's the Chesapeake Innovation Center. I believe that's the arm of the Chesapeake Conservancy that's doing all this work in cooperation with USGS um, and other partners, University of Vermont, several several people, um, several different uh, consultants on this cooperative agreement. It's covering four objectives. One of the objectives was to produce even better high resolution, um, one meter high resolution land cover land use data set for the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership on a watershed wide scale. So they did that um, and it's available. It became available um, fully in May, just so just about a month ago. Um, and they developed land cover land use and a change product, which I'll talk about here in a minute for all the counties within the watershed based on 2017, 2018 imagery and ancillary data. Um, they also remapped the 13-14 product using the classification schema that they developed for the 2017-18 um, land use land cover data sets. Um, when I also say this data is produced for all counties, if a county is only partially within a watershed, within the Chesapeake Bay watershed, they still map to the whole county. So um, most, uh, some of my localities were partially in the watershed, but the whole county data set is available, which is really nice. Unfortunately, the whole state of Virginia wasn't remapped this time, so we don't have a statewide data set, but, um, but what we do have is, is for the watershed. And so that's what this is all available for you um, on this slide. And I believe Laura has all of the resources available um, in uh, handouts that, that will be coming out. But 
there is a website and materials available. The Chesapeake Conservancy put together this website. We have a data viewer um, that has a slider and you can zoom in and out for locality. I'm not gonna dive into the details of any of this. I'm not gonna do like a demo. That would take a lot of time, but um, you can slide back and forth and look at land cover versus land use. And um, they have, so they have the data viewer for the 1718 data set. And then they also have a lot of descriptions. So defining all those classifications, um, there are 18 broad classifications like land, like water, um, wetlands, impervious, uh, agricultural, stuff like that. And then within those classifications are subclassifications. There are 54 of those. All those details are in the documentation on that website, as well as the methodology used to develop um, those classifications. All of this information and work was run through the land use work group with the Bay Program Partnership with all the hard work happening um, in the background at the Conservancy and in the USGS land use data team. Um, and then you can also go here and just download um, county specific GIS files for land cover and land use data for that um, remapped 13, 14 data set, as well as the 17, 18 data set. Um, in addition to this, first of its kind, land use change data was developed. Um, and that is changing from the 2013, 14 imagery and what changed over time to 17, 18. So those four years of land use change are also available. You can go to this viewer, the image on the right shows that, and you're gonna get something like this. This is just a zoom in here of the 13, 14 NAEP imagery viewer on the left, the 17, 18 NAEP imagery on the right, and the actual change product on, on the far right. Um, and so in 13, 14, in this particular area, you know, this was all considered forest. And then it became low vegetation in 17, 18. And this, you know, sort of green blob here, you can click on and it will tell you uh, this, this landscape changed from forest to low vegetation. What's, and what's great about this is we're doing this all over again. Um, right now, they are mapping um, and get processing the data and mapping for 21, 2021 and 2022 imagery. So this will be another four years later data set. And what that's gonna tell you, if you look at the Google Earth for this panel here on the right, these are all solar fields now. So you will have another change product that's going to tell you this went from forest to low veg to solar in 2022 or 2021. Um, so all of that is available as well at the website and you can download this, this GIS uh, shape file to, for the change product itself on a county by county scale. Um, and also they provided a matrix of change in Excel spreadsheets either the change going from the 18 classification to 18 classification for the 13, 14, 17, 18, or all 54 of those classification changes. It's a lot to process. It's a lot to look at. I encourage you to, to play around with this data set. Um, I, I, it's, it's really valuable information to have. So in, with that said, you know, I decided I'll just poke around a little bit, provide some high, very high level uh, pieces of information for folks. This is a, a watershed um, view of, of numbers that I'm going to just show you really quickly. Um, I didn't want to get too granular in the state level, but um, big buckets of land use that people care about in the Bay Program are things like agricultural, forested lands, and developed lands. So the Bay watershed is predominantly made up of natural acres, of 66% of natural acres are forested um, lands, followed by about 21% of agricultural acres, and 14% of developed acres in the watershed. Um, and when you process that data and you put it into what's called the, the CAST modeling tool, if you're familiar with that, that will tell you what the loading rates are from these land uses. Um, you can really get granular with this data set. And this is again, really, really broad overview, but we're noting that the majority of our loads of nitrogen, so total nitrogen coming from the Bay watershed are actually coming from agricultural lands, followed by developed lands. Um, and then forested lands. So that's what this is telling you is that the forested landscapes or the natural lands have the lowest loading rate per acre, which is what is to be expected. We, we want, you know, the more forest you have, the less you're gonna have um, of pollutants entering into your waterways, for example. Um, but these are just really informative numbers to tell you um, that you can get down to all kinds of different levels and say, um, what is what is the loading rate happening in my locality or in my river basin or in my state? Well, you know, what am I concerned about in terms of this land use and this certain and this pollutant of either nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment? Again, you can't get this from downloading just the land use data. You have to start looking deeper into into the modeling um, information that's out there. But this is just a, an idea of the information that you can gather um, if you if you so choose. 
Um, another thing that I thought was interesting from the land use change product, again, this is only four years of change data, um, but we are losing significant amounts of natural or forested acres, over 300,000 acres. And most of those acres are either going into impervious and turf grass, um, agricultural, or what's this catch-all category called mixed open. And mixed open is, with four years <clears throat> of change, it's a tough category to sort of break open, but it's, a, it's basically something that's low vegetation, or it's hard to tell based on the imagery or the ancillary data what it is exactly uh, being used for. And, but a lot of times we can break this further open into harvested forest or transitional land uses that maybe it's going to go into developed um, or so, so it can be broken up, but a lot of it is going into what's considered a transitional or a mixed open um, land use. So just again, more food for thought about what you can get for some of this data. Um, and then I just kind of gonna close here in the next couple of slides. Um, I, you know, my background is water quality and every day when I talk to folks, I'm talking to folks about water quality. I don't often, even though my title says planner, water resources planner, I don't often talk to a lot of planners and I'm really trying to, um, to, to rectify that a little bit more because I think that there is a decoupling of land use planning and water quality management often. I, I talk a lot to stormwater managers and environmental folks um, in, in the localities. And I think that making the connection of land use planning and how that impacts our local waterways can be really, really important. Um, and I think this data set can help bridge that gap, um, particularly when you're looking at the change process or the change uh, product. So, you know, what can we learn from this data? I mean, this is just a few things I picked, but um, there's so many things. We can assess conservation needs. I know that the state of Maryland is doing a healthy watersheds report that can be really valuable and is um, helping them identify high conservation lands. And it is using and going to be incorporating this new um, land use data. Uh, we can evaluate buffer protections and where can they be maximized along stream corridors. Localities can use this to assess their tree canopy change. Um, sometimes LIDAR data might be better depending on what scale you're looking at, but this data can be really a good broad brush analysis for assessing what's happened in your locality uh, and looking at development patterns and figuring out, you know, can we start uh, incentivizing infill and redevelopment if we need to, if our development patterns are showing such sprawl that's actually going to be impacting our waterways. Um, this data can also be used to integrate a variety of different plans that folks are doing already in their localities. Folks are working on resilience plans, hazard mitigation plans, plans to address water quality, whether it's a TMDL action plan or an implementation plan. All of this data can be used to cohesively throughout all of these plans. And I'm not going to talk about smart growth because I don't have a lot of experience in that, but I do think that planning ahead and using what's passed as prologue is something that we can really be informed um, from from checking out this data. So that's all I'm gonna say. I know that it was a lot. Um, I, I appreciate the time, the opportunity to provide these introductions. I think we're gonna be hearing a lot from all the other experts in the field um, doing this work, but I really encourage you to check out the data and, um, and that's it. So thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, Casey. I think uh, we're gonna have a poll question here. Um, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, I think we're gonna do that next. Um, but yeah, thanks, Casey, for that, because, you know, really, it is, um, it is critical to know, I mean, to have, to have this data, to have these, um, you know, monitoring programs to see how well we're doing, like, are the, are the you know, are the, are the mitigation efforts we're working on, are they working? Um, you know, it's a, it's a report card for us. And um, you mentioned um, not speaking too much about the smart growth tools. Well, I, I hope that's a good segue into the next talk, because uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit and talk a little bit about um, kind of the, that hierarchy you discuss, you know, in terms of like the planning um, kind of working its way to the water quality and, and, and that nexus there. So hopefully, hopefully we can achieve that. Um, and you should be able to see the poll. So if you could go ahead and, uh, okay, looks like, all right, we're on it, we're on it. <laughs> um, so I... It looks like I can just read these for you. It looks like it looks like the majority of our respondents have not um, downloaded the data from, from the Chesapeake Bay program. So um, myself included, it looks like something that we could all learn more about and to go download that. Um, and it looks like, yeah, it looks like the majority of us, it, it would be, you know, relevant to, to our work. So thanks for participating in that. Uh, we're going to move on now to um, to the next discussion, which is uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed protection in Delaware. And I'm going to uh, invite uh, Jennifer Walls to come on with me. 
Um, you obviously heard uh, my introduction, but my co-presenter today is, uh, is, is, is Jen Walls, and she's a principal planner with, Den with uh, DENREC, which is the, uh, the, the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control with Delaware. Um, she's with the Division of Watershed Stewardship. And for the last 20 years, she's been involved in the development and implementation of watershed implementation and pollution control strategies to address TMDLs in Delaware. And that is why she is on here with me to speak about those env <laughs> the environmental pieces. Uh, she has served as a key member of Delaware's Chesapeake Bay team for most of that time. She has worked with state, local, federal, and nonprofit partners to develop and implement strategies, including those related to low impact development, green infrastructure, and local land use to improve water quality in Delaware. She's a graduate of the uh, University of Delaware's College of Agriculture and Natural Resources with a degree in natural resources management and served in the United States Coast Guard Reserve for nine years as a Marine Service Technician. Um, so with that, we will go ahead, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so hopefully we can all see this, hopefully we can see the slide and presenter view. Jen, can I get a thumbs up if we're good? All right, good. So, um, so Jen and I are gonna talk, uh, talk today about uh, Delaware. And you know, when we um, when we wanna do this webinar, we really wanted to kind of give some Delaware specific examples of smart growth tools and resources, um, you know, that we have both from the planning side, um, you know, strictly um, land use, uh, location-based planning, and then, um, you know, environmental programs as well. So um, I'll, I'll start off with just a, a quick map of, of the portion of the watershed that appears in Delaware. And that is uh, here in, in red on, on the map on the left. And then the map on the right, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in greater detail, but you can see that the upper and lower Chesapeake Bay watershed um, covers you know, roughly 30% or so, uh, Jen might know uh, uh, a more exact number, but uh, of the land area in Delaware. And it's interesting because you can see that our de more developed areas are on the Delaware Bay side. Um, and then you have our, uh, you know, predominantly rural and agricultural areas more on the upper and lower uh, on the Chesapeake side, which, you know, obviously based on Casey's discussion, um, you know, creates its own problems when we have a lot of agricultural land. But also it, um, it's, it's important for us for the Chesapeake Bay watershed to make sure we have proper, um, land use and smart growth planning within these areas to make sure we don't have a lot of uh, the urban encroachment. So um, we'll start off with just a, a planning framework. And you know, this is similar to a lot of areas, but I know every state and locality is different. Um, so in this framework, I'm gonna be talking about the comprehensive plan as, as a tool, as well as Delaware's um, state strategies for policies and spending and then the preliminary land use service and, and, and all the ways that those uh, tools help us um, direct and, and guide uh, land use decisions. And then uh, Jen's gonna talk about kind of the, uh, you know, the state programs and, and plans that feed into that process. And also um, she's, you know, she's more knowledgeable about the federal and state regulations uh, regarding um, uh, watershed protection and water quality. So all of this fits together to inform the local land use authority and decision-making process. So I'm gonna, um, I, I'll touch on this briefly. I assume that the majority of people on this call are, are familiar with comprehensive plan, but just the, uh, for the Delaware framework, obviously it's, a, it's an important tool for us because uh, our, our, 60 municip or our 60 local governments have to uh, update their plan every 10 years. And it requires that future land use map, that growth plan. And any of the communities that have greater than 2,000 persons, they also have to um, have, have uh, strategies, you know, goals, objectives, and strategies regarding um, you know, how they're going to protect the natural environment and how they're going to uh, manage their wastewater systems um, so that we don't have um, you know, uh, too much impervious surface, so that we don't have um, you know, on-site septic systems and so forth. Um, so really, the, the main benefit of this tool, as you can imagine, is it helps set the framework for managed growth, and it also helps direct growth to areas that has infrastructure um, and discourage it from areas that are um, you know, more rural in nature and, um, and, and would make us uh, you know, sprawl. So 
I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about the state strategies because really this is the way that we, um, uh, you know, one of the ways that we we sort of work with the local governments to implement uh, their plans. And um, this is a, a a policy document that is endorsed by the governor of Delaware and um, you know by executive order every five years, and it, it essentially breaks all of the land area in Delaware into five different categories, which I'll get into um, in the next couple of slides. And the main benefit of that is it it um, it coordinates the the land use decisions with the provision of state services. Um, the bulk of uh, infrastructure serve, uh, infrastructure in Delaware is, is provided by the state, which is different than some other states where there's more of a local focus. Um, so land use decisions made at the local level, um, state resources such as uh, you know, transportation facilities and school funding, just to name two, are at the state level. So it, uh, the strategies level, it, the strategies is a resource for local governments to say, this is where the state believes that growth is smartest. This is where we want to invest money in state services and infrastructure, and it coordinates that land use. And then of course we monitor how well we're doing by, um, by, by tracking development trends um, and, uh, and collecting that from the towns and mapping that, that data. So it is a very um, in, intense spatial analysis that takes growth layers, it adds those, takes all the preservation and conservation layers and subtracts those um, approximately 40 different layers in a, in a GIS and mapping program. And just to briefly go through it, not to list every layer, but you know, areas where we have planned growth, utilities, you know, emergency services, public services, all of those uh, areas where growth, where growth, where the areas are, have planned and are more prepared for growth go into the first um, cut, or I guess the addition. And then the all the natural lands, um, lands you know, for resiliency and sustainability, ag lands, um, areas where growth should be limited is put into the second piece. Um, and those are layers that are excluded. And when you do that, you essentially get, um, this is a, you know, obviously a high level view of the map, but essentially this is the um, kind of, uh, Newcastle County, Sussex County, Kent County are three counties in Delaware. That's the way the map ends up looking. And I will show you the, the, the levels in more detail, but essentially you can see that all of the areas along the coast, for example, um, are, are, the, are considered the out of play areas, areas that you know, really should be left natural um, uh, and so forth. And then you have your more urban areas in red. So putting that in, into perspective for the, for the Chesapeake Bay uh, watershed, you can see that um, going back to the map I first showed, you can see that you know level one areas are areas that are in the in a municipality or um, or within the the growth and annexation area where you expect to have growth, um, and then level two and orange is where you would also uh, expect to have some infill uh, infill development or or development around the fringe of the town. Level three areas in yellow are, are, more, are the suburban areas. Um, and, you know, there's, there are some environmental constraints there. So we want to see limited growth in those areas. And everything that's not showing on the map would be level four, where we don't want to see growth, level uh, and then out of play, which are the protected lands. Um, so you can see here, as I mentioned before, in Delaware, you know, we have a sort of a, um, a growth corridor um, in the lower uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed. And then you can see there that, you know, large, largely, um, you know, fed by the Nanticoke River here. Um, so these are the areas where we've really got to make sure that we don't um, sprawl out of control and that we kind of keep our, our development um, confined to those areas where they're most appropriate, um, where it's uh, most appropriate and where the, you know, the state uh, and working with Jen and Denmark, you know, is 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 prepared um, to handle that growth. So, um, one of the ways that we implement the state strategies is through the preliminary land use uh, service, and that is um, a state state agency review of land use proposals um, based on thresholds. So, like, at the baseline is greater than fifty units or greater than fifty thousand square feet of commercial, 
And um, when those, uh, you know, they're required by state code to, to be reviewed by our office, the Office of State Planning Coordination. And then like um, Jen's colleagues at DENREC, they review all of the development proposals with us. Um, it, it informs all the developers about the, all the regulations that they're required to follow, but it also provides another critical piece. One of the main benefits of this program is it provides recommendations um, that are critical to protecting uh, environmental resources. So it may be, uh, you know, we can uh, assist with the design process and try to, um, you know, inform them of best practices um, so they can, uh, you know, design the sites to be least impactful. Now, does it always work? No. I mean, sometimes, you know, developers can make the decisions, right, as long as they meet, as long as they meet code. But this is definitely a tool to continue to, um, to work on, on these smart growth principles. And I'll, I'll try to wrap this up quickly so, um, so, so Jen can have some time. So one of the other um, implementation tools for us in the state are the downtown development districts. Um, we have 12, currently have 12 districts. And, you know, like the name suggests, they're in downtown areas. And it really, it, it, it is an incentive program that, that um, tries to promote private investment in downtown areas. And of course, the, the benefit of that would be to encourage the infill uh, redevelopment of downtowns, those level one areas I talked about, and also to, to discourage the sprawling development in, in, in strategy levels uh, three to four. So that's a lot to, to get through, but now I'm gonna turn it over to Jen, who's gonna talk about um, you know, DENREX programs and, and, and how, how, how they can you know, help promote smart growth and, and, and uh, reduce the um, impacts to water quality. So. Take it away, Jen. Thanks, Josh. Um, so uh, you've heard about sort of the Chesapeake land use tools um, Casey talked about, and and Josh has talked about our state strat kind of our state strategies and uh, tools that we have. Um, so we we also utilize the TMDL um, and watershed implementation plans um, to manage water quality um, and and manage growth. So. The TMDL and the plans. Um, oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, so, <laughs> so we've been working on the Chesapeake Bay Plan um, for you know twenty plus years. It does provide accountability features um, to the state. We have worked to incorporate the TMDL and our implementation plans into uh, the Plus process that Josh mentioned. Um, we we also utilize that comprehensive plan process as well um, to encourage. Uh, local local governments to consider water quality management um, as a priority uh, within within their communities. Um, we've also taken advantage of, of this process, I guess you could say, to help us in revising um, and revamping some of our state regulations, uh, particularly um, incorporating some of uh, voluntary recommendations or recommendations from stakeholders to strengthen regulations related to stormwater and wastewater. Uh, so we've taken those efforts um, kind of through this TMDL process and, and tried to strengthen uh, those regulations statewide. We do have water quality concerns um, throughout the entire state. Um, and so uh, the Chesapeake Bay wall is a, while it may, covers a third of the state, we, we utilize that to expand um, to cover other areas as well, um, as far as improvements. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, um, we're looking at 25% reductions in nitrogen, 24% reduction in phosphorus, and about 20% in sediment overall. Um, as you saw on the map that, that Josh presented, the bulk of our watershed, the Chesapeake Bay watershed in Delaware, is agriculture. Um, it's only about 10% that's developed, um, and that does provide cha um, create challenges for us um, because in the ag sector, uh, practices that can be implemented are, are really on a voluntary basis. And so we have to take advantage of um, a lot of outreach and marketing, as well as cost share opportunities through partners such as NRCS and the conservation districts. Uh, we also work very closely with our um, municipal uh, uh, municipalities um, to provide technical assistance and to encourage um, uh, implementation of of practices that will address you know, nutrients from that sector. And you'll hear about some of that work when, when um, Ed gives his presentation. Um, we do have a deadline of 2025 
um, to meet our TMDL goals in the Chesapeake. Um, so we're kind of on this downward, um, the downward slide, I guess you could say. Um, part of the, the Bay TMDL effort and the Chesapeake Bay program effort, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, there's also um, this process of, of two-year milestones. And so we, we take advantage of those milestones and we use those milestones to help us uh, stay on track with our implementation. Um, and some of the things that we in include in our milestones are related to um, providing that technical assistance I mentioned um, for things like MS4, uh, municipal stormwater uh, regulations to our local governments. Um, we have outreach opportunities and, and programs that um, encourage homeowners to uh, limit you know nutrient applications to their lawns um, and in other parts of the state those some of those practices will have to go much further than they may in the Chesapeake just because of the the, the, um, the land use that we're dealing with so um, the other some of the other practices that we have focused on uh, for the next couple of years or we have planned for the next couple of years um, include um, focusing on and encouraging conservation, landscape practices, tree plantings um, in urban and, um, and rural areas. We're working on a riparian buffer strategy. Um, I think one um, item that will go a long way in helping us to maybe achieve that um, is uh, Sussex County has recently adopted an ordinance uh, for to uh, require riparian buffers along wetlands. Um, so we'll be hoping to take advantage of some of the work that they're doing, partnering with them um, to, to complete some analysis um, of the potential impact of that. Um, but that was a huge benefit, I think a huge benefit and a long time coming um, to get that, that ordinance um, on the ground. So we appreciate the efforts of partners and our, our municipal governments that work with us very closely uh, to, to get this work done. Um, Josh, can you move to the next slide for me, please? And I mentioned technical assistance um, and funding. So, you know, in order to get these practices on the ground, particularly voluntary practices, um, we we need financial and technical resources, and we've made those available to our local governments um, to implement the strategies. Through and we we do that through grants and, and cost share assistance. Um, we have provided funds, you know, for infrastructure upgrades uh, at the wastewater treatment plant level, um, septic system, individual septic system level, um, stormwater management, green infrastructure, um, all of those things. And then we work um, very closely with NRCS and our conservation district partners as well to provide cost share assistance to farmers who are interested in um, implementing practices. We also work closely with our um, forestry um, section uh, in the Department of Ag. Uh, they have a um, urban forestry program that we work very closely with to encourage um, uh, planting of trees. And we're again, working with our urban partners to do that. Um, we also try to utilize our Chesapeake Bay funding um, to leverage other projects and other funding sources. Um, so we, we, because we're a small state, I think it makes things, sometimes that makes it a little bit easier um, to, to get some of that done um, as well. Um, a couple other new things I didn't put together this put this together on the slide, but it also related to kind of this overall topic of tools for protecting the Bay watershed and um, in back in November, our governor signed um, and our secretary signed off on our uh, Delaware climate action plan and one of the components of that action plan is a. Um, a program called trees for every Delawarean initiative and so we've also incorporated the work kind of that that effort into our. Um, TMDL and, and Chesapeake Bay milestones. And what the, the Teddy uh, program does is it, um, help, it, it developed a tracker and uh, an outreach to folks who are interested in planting trees to be able to track where those, act, those tree planting activities are happening. Um, and we can post up, I'll post the link to that in the, um, in the chat here before the end of the session, but um, it's, it's a pretty neat opportunity to track where trees are being planted, provide outreach, um, and to help um, folks understand some of the impacts of climate change and in turn as well, water quality. So, um, you know, we, we try to take advantage of all of the opportunities that we can. Um, I think that's the end of my slides. Josh, did, did you want me yeah, to? Yeah, no, that's- I don't, wanna, I, would, I don't wanna get us off track on time. Yeah, that's all right, that's it. And we're already, uh, you know, I think we're already kind of running over, but um, yeah. what, what um, 
what we'll, what we'll do is we'll just flash these real quick and show you that we did include um, resources from the Office of State Planning and resources from DENREC. And of course, those those slides will go out. So don't obviously worry about you know capturing that. Those slides will go out. And then of course, you know if you have any questions, uh, Jen and I would you can always email us and, and we'll get back to you. So thank you, Jen. Um, sorry if I compressed us. You know it's a lot of information to get out there. <laughs> and uh, you know I um, and you know it's being recorded and uh, and all that good stuff. So we can um, we can uh, follow up with questions later. So thank you, Jen. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Ed Lewandowski. Um, hopefully, Ed, you're okay with me abbreviating the, the bio just a little bit to get us back on track. And I will put. It, <laughs> I'm going to put it. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat for everyone. But essentially, but um, let me stop sharing my screen here. All right, Ed, you should be able to share yours now. Um, Ed is a coastal communities development specialist with the Delaware Sea Grant Marine Advisory Service at UD. Um, and uh, prior to joining the university, he spent 13 years with the nonprofit center for the Inland Bays, the Delaware Inland Bays National Estuary Program, um, you know, serving as its executive director for a time. He holds a master's degree in organizational leadership and attained his undergrad, obtained his undergraduate degree in marine biology. So hopefully that, that was an okay abbreviation, Ed, and um, uh, we welcome you to the stage. Uh, Wanishi, Josh, Wanishi, thank you. So OCO, everyone, OCO, uh, hello. We kanawash, good to see you. So these are Nanticoke greetings for those of you who are not familiar. The Nanticoke are the indigenous people of Southern Delaware. Now, if it was 1879 and you were a Nanticoke child enrolled at the Carlisle Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, you would not have been allowed to speak those words. The Carlisle School was the first off-reservation Native American boarding school in this country, and it served as the principal model for more than 350 other schools that followed. Canada even modeled its schools after ours. The founder of the Carlisle School was a retired military veteran named Colonel Richard Henry Pratt. Now, Pratt is infamous for having once said, kill the Indian, save the man. And I guess that could be interpreted as destroy the race, but keep the warm body around for hard labor. Now, the objective of Pratt schools was to assimilate or civil, civilize Native American youth into Euro-American society. So how was this achieved? Well, first, uh, many students or children were forcibly removed from their families and their reservation. And uh, essentially they're cultural identity was stripped. When they arrived at the school, they were given English names. Their hair was cut to a standard style and length. And for the boys, this meant that their ponytails, their culturally important ponytails were chopped off. All the students were required to wear the same uniforms. Look at the photo and you can see that homogeneity became the norm. Uh, they were also asked to remember the names of the US presidents and they were absolutely prohibited from speaking their native tongue. And if caught doing so, the punishment could be very severe. One such punishment was to insert metal pins into the tongue of the offenders. I said pins, plural, not pin. Now, after about seven to 10 days, when the scar tissue in the tongue began to harden, these pins would be unceremoniously ripped out. So it was atrocities such as this that really began the demise of the Native American language here in this country, and that included the Nanticoke language. I was unaware of these atrocities that occurred at the Native American boarding school. I'd read a little bit in the headlines over the past couple of years about some burial sites that were discovered that were associated with these schools. But this story was shared with me by Raggy Callantine, and Raggy is a traditional storyteller with the Nanticoke tribe. And she was sharing this story to express to me how important this project at Tidewater Park was to her people because it was helping them to resurrect their Native American language. So what does this have to do with Chesapeake Bay smart growth strategies? Well, this project began as a land use planning and water quality effort. It was back in 2012 when I rolled in the Laurel, Delaware with Jen Walls and a couple of other colleagues and we were there to develop a Chesapeake phase two watershed implementation plan or WIP. So we engaged community officials and stakeholders in some land use growth and development planning using community viz scenario 360. 
We then aligned the growth and development that the community desired with potential strategies for the required nutrient offsets. And when we finished this work, and it took us several months to get to a point where the community was comfortable with the land use scenarios and the proposed offsets. But when we finished this work, that stakeholder group, those same people we just worked with, made a request of us. They said, help us bring people and jobs back to downtown Laurel. No simple task. So to start, we led a public conversation and that eventually resulted in a landscape level design for water re waterfront redevelopment along the Broad Creek. And that plan was called the Ramble. It was produced by uh, Dr. Jules Brock, who is uh, my colleague and just left us at, for the University of Florida, where she's now the director of the landscape architecture program down there. But uh, she did this plan with one of her grad students. And the plan, as you see it on the screen, was adopted by the town council in 2014. Now, one of the proposed components was a nature play area that was originally named Governor's Park and Independence Playground. Five former governors of Delaware hailed from Laurel, so it seemed like a fitting tribute. But as we dug a little deeper into the history of the property, we realized that the Nanticoke people were the original inhabitants of Laurel, Delaware. And furthermore, about 3,000 acres along the Broad Creek were set aside as a reservation in 1705. Now, unfortunately, that reservation was stripped away from them in 1768 by the colonial government, and that began the great migration of the Nanticoke people northward. So, we changed our direction with this project now that we had this understanding and we renamed that parcel Tidewater Park because the word Nanticoke translates as Tidewater people or people of the Tidewaters. But we still wanted to focus on a nature-based play theme. So Jules suggested that the play features that should go there should reflect the folklore of the Nanticoke tribe. Now Tidewater Park sits on about four and a half acres of land that was once mostly turf grass with a few trees and the area was subject to standing water during heavy rainfalls because it drained about two and a half acres of impervious surface. And we were fortunate enough to receive some grant monies from DENREC to do um, some stormwater feasibility studies as well as a phase one environmental assessment and then some surface water planning so that we could come up with a design for that site. And after an initial environmental assessment an engineer with uh, Foresight Associates, Drew Hayes, came up with the concept of putting in a bioswale and a constructed wetland. And you can see that conceptual drawing. And what's really cool about this, if you look at the bioswale, it's in the shape of a snake. And that was intentional. He did that to honor uh, some of the folklore of the Nanticokes as well. I can't recall the nutrient reduction, um, the volumes of water treated, and how many pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus are removed, but it was significant. And so the project was appealing from that aspect. But it is around these stormwater treatments that this nature-based play area is being installed. And there are four components to that. We worked with Compton Incorporated. They are one of the world's leaders in designing play elements, active play elements. So they created some incredibly unique nature play elements for our park. Um, there are four stories that we are featuring. Uh, phase one of the Nanticoke stories is Turtle Island, the story of creation. And then we have How the Beaver Got Its Tail. These features were installed last October. At each play piece, you see the beaver there. It's a, it's a piece that came from custom made out of the Czech Republic. Um, but each play piece has associated with it an interpretive panel. And that panel shares an excerpt of the story uh, as told by the ancestors. And it has a glossary of Nanticoke wor uh, words that are included in the story. So if you scan that QR code, what you will be led to is a YouTube video and you'll get to hear Na uh, Raggy Callantine, the traditional storyteller, tell that story in its entirety using some of her native tongue. So phase one is done uh, this summer. We will be installing next month a swing set component as well as a 30 by 30 shade sail structure, which is important on a parcel that is really baked by the sun daily. Um, but the big news for us, oh, you can see is, is the, the future phases here. Uh, that is Rainbow Crow, the story of Rainbow Crow. Folks, that is a 30 foot tall crow with a six, no, 16 foot tall crow with a 30 foot wingspan. 
And then you see the story of Squirrel Council. So the big news for us is that these two play components, Rainbow Crow and Squirrel Council, have been included by both of our US senators in their CDS requests, their congressionally directed spending request for the proposed federal budget. So uh, assuming that Congress does what it's constitutionally mandated to do and passes a federal budget this year, this project could be potentially completed by fall of 2023. We would then be able to invite back Chief Natasha Carmine from the Nendico tribe, as well as the spiritual leader, Herman Jackson, to again, bless the park with a spiritual blessing. So if you'd like to learn more about Tidewater Park and uh, participate in a virtual tour, you can scan that QR code that is on your screen right now. And it will take you uh, to a round me 360 virtual tour that is fairly comprehensive and you get a good feel for what's planned, what is currently there, and some of the ele other elements that we've been working with along the Broad Creek. So I just want to acknowledge uh, all, all of the following, and we can add Senator Chris Coons and Senator Tom Carper to that list as well, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. Um, we, we, uh, well, and you, you, you helped get us back on schedule. <laughs> so we appreciate that. Um, fascinating story. Um, we're going to move on. Uh, looks like we got questions coming in the Q and A. So we'll move on to Paul and then hopefully we'll have some, uh, some time for some live questions at the end. Um, so Paul, I'm going to, uh, go ahead and, uh, introduce you as our final speaker for, uh, for this lunch hour. Um, Paul Desjardins is, uh, I'm going to talk about planning for growth in metropolitan Washington. He's the director of the Department of Community Planning and Services of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, the regional organization of the, of the DC metro area uh, local governments, uh, plus area members of Maryland and Virginia's legislatures, legislatures, excuse me, the US Senate and the US House of Representatives. Um, he leads COG's work in regional planning and land use. Um, he's, he's been with COG for 35 years, so, so welcome, Paul. All right, thank you, Josh. Share my screen here. Come on, there we go. You yep, that you're up? good to go. Good, thanks. All right, thanks so much. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I, I, when Laura asked me to be a part of this, she did ask me how long I've been at COG. Um, it's interesting, I have been there a long time and I actually overlapped when Governor Glenn Denning teed up the whole concept of smart growth and have since worked with a number of his original smart growth cabinet members. So it's something that's really pretty much ingrained into our DNA and what we do at COG. Um, a couple of things, I'll talk very briefly about what COG is and I know the slides will be available after this. So I'll go through this pretty quickly and try and keep it you know, kind of high level. We'll talk a little bit about forecasting growth in the region because I actually want to say, as you see in that next bullet, we actually have some smart growth constructs that we have adopted at COG that I, I'm actually pretty optimistic that we are actually doing a pretty good job um, when it comes to planning for land use and growth. And then lastly, want to focus just a little bit, and this really is front and center for me when it comes to any conversations about growth, the economy, land use, what have you. It's the uncertainty of what does the world look like post-COVID? Whoops, wrong direction. So this is COG, this is our footprint. We're smaller than the MSA. Um, about 300 elected officials are our members, as Josh said, from local, state, and congressional delegations. We're also the MPO for transportation planning. And it's really important because since 1990, with the first passage of surface transportation legislation, I've spent the lion's share of my career in conversations talking about how to focus growth how it can best be accommodated, principally from a transportation standpoint, but also how it makes sense fiscally uh, for local governance. So essentially, why is smart growth important? Whoops, keep going the wrong way. Very quickly, if you go to our website and I can put a link in the chat, these are some examples of some major priorities for COG um, over the last few years. We had a huge lift three years ago at this time, working with a number of our partners on housing targets. A couple of years ago, many of you remember, we um, were successful in attracting um, the Amazon HQ2 headquarters to um, Arlington County. And one of the things we learned through that process, they came in and they said, you know, you guys aren't the Bay Area, you're not 
um, you know, Boston or New York, but you guys really have to get a handle on this housing affordability problem. And so we took it on, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, about not just the amount, but where the housing needs to go. Because um, again, we are all about the spatial relationships, the dynamic system of how the region functions. Again, linking housing and growth to transportation, but also preservation of open space and our environment. A couple of other bullets on there. We adopted a climate plan um, and action goals uh, uh, two years ago. And then I'll talk in a few minutes too about these other uh, spatial constructs, what I would argue are again, sort of smart growth uh, lenses um, called high capacity transit stations and equity emphasis areas. So real quickly about our forecast, this is a, a schematic of how the process works. It's been in place since the 70s when the planning directors agreed they wanted a consistent set of growth projections for our region to guide local and regional planning, capital improvements programs, investment in transportation and infrastructure and whatnot. We call it a top-down, bottom-up process. The top being this blue box, which is an econometric model that says, if you roll everything together from an econometric standpoint, this is the maximum amount of growth the Washington region would get. The strength of the process, though, is this red box here. Since the 70s, on a fairly regular basis, we engage with our local governments and the surrounding jurisdictions beyond our footprint to take a look at, in the near term, what's being approved in permitting activity where dirt's being turned, the permit's being issued, but also where growth is, is uh, planned for and can be accommodated through comprehensive and small area plans. We reconcile those projections and roll it into um, a consistent set of growth forecasts um, uh, for the 3,000 or so traffic zones that are our, uh, our, our modeling foundation. Very similar uh, you know, sort of lens that other regions uh, undertake. So here's our forecast, the most recent, we're just approved. We're looking at about 881,000 more jobs, about 1.3 million more people, about 536,000 um, households. So a couple of things, this is uh, you know, slower growth than we've seen in the past, but one thing that's important, and it goes back to this, where can growth best be accommodated and how can it best be served? Because when you look at the forecast, jobs in sheer number and rate are growing faster than the households that will provide the workers to fill those jobs. And that really was the underpinning of the conversation we have when we set our housing targets that we are really, you know, not only have we become a region where um, residential growth, housing uh, uh, construction has become unaffordable, um, it's going to be an economic detriment to um, our region and the successes we've had. So very quickly, these are a couple charts showing you what does that pattern of growth look like. So the light pinkish uh, rose color there in each bar shows the number of jobs that were on the ground in a particular jurisdiction in the year 2020. And then the darker red shows you what that jurisdiction is anticipating over the next 25 years between 2020 and 2045. So again, you see the district would have the greatest number of jobs or did rather followed by Fairfax, Montgomery and Prince George's counties. And then again, you can see um, the red increments here showing the amount of growth expected in each of those jurisdictions um, over the next couple of years. I apologize, my dogs have discovered the dogs next door. Um, couple things I point out to you is look at the relative scale here. This is what's on the ground and this is the increment of what is expected to be added over the next few years, next 25 years rather. Similar for household growth. Fairfax County, Montgomery, Prince George's, the district and at that order for the total number of households that are on the ground in 2020 and then the darker blue portion showing the increment of growth that's expected over the next 25 years. So I bring that up in the context you can see in here, and I'll show you a couple maps in a second that really drive this home. We talk a lot about growth and we have very bad transportation problems, we have housing affordability problems, but here's the hard fact, and I mentioned this to my co-panelists when we were playing the session, 80% of 2045 is on the ground right now. We spend a lot of time talking about alternative scenarios and what can we do to influence the future, which is what we should do because we're a planning organization. But the hard reality is, so much of the future is here now, and we're actually faced with having to be very strategic um, about what can we do to influence that. So a couple quick maps that will emphasize that. This is 
2015 and 2015 to 2045, slightly different time frame, but this is employment. The lighter rose colored dots show jobs that were on the ground. Each one of those um, is 500 jobs that were on the ground in 2015. The darker red that you can see is what's projected over the next 25 years. And you can see some very distinct patterns going right through the middle of the district out the Roslyn Boston corridor here in Arlington. <laughs> That triangle, that's Tyson's Corner, that's the I-270 corridor in Montgomery County. But if you look at the map, it's very focused, it's very concentrated. And I'll talk a little bit more about goals that we've set regarding that in just a second. This is the companion, and this really is the challenge when we have these conversations about growth and smart growth and focusing and linking growth in making capital investments. This is households, light blue dots, are 500, each one is 500 households in the year 2015. The darker blue dots are what is expected between 2015 and 2045. Same thing though, if you look at the darker blue dots, it's actually very focused. Again, there's the Roslyn Boston corridor. There's Tyson's corner. This is heading out towards Reston and Herndon, the I-270 corridor. What we are planning for in the future is actually very focused. And that really, again, goes speaks to the heart of you know, the foundation of our local government plans and some goals and aspirations that we set out in the future. And that's what I want to talk really briefly about here right now. This is a document called Region Forward. It's our vision plan, our comprehensive plan, our regional plan, whatever you want to call it, that um, my team and I uh, developed uh, going back to 2010. Like any good plan, it has, uh, you know, growth, or I'm sorry, it has um, different domains, different pillars, if you will, you know, these different goal areas for land use, transportation, the economy, but it's all wrapped around these sort of pillars, if you will, of prosperity, accessibility, livability, and sustainability. So it's a very real vision that really drives every part of our work program at the Council of Governments, both on the technical side and on the policy side. And so one of the things that I mentioned before, and I showed you the maps and the forecasts about growth, this is focusing again from region forward. When we compiled that document, I mentioned before growth areas in each one or goals and targets in each one of these nine, uh, nine broad themes. So we have targets and indicators, metrics that we agreed, we put our hands over our hearts and said, we're going to try and, and, and do our best to achieve on those different goals in the economy or in transportation or what have you. So let me focus on accessibility because this really goes to the heart again of how we have really tried to take on the idea of smart growth and focusing growth the way you saw it in those maps. So we looked at an indicator from the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Many of you are familiar with it. It's about the, you know, the two biggest costs that a household burden or is burdened with, which is housing and transportation costs. We actually set a goal that these places, these priority places, like what you see depicted here, which is a rendering of Tyson's Corner, we set goals and said, in these priority places, we don't want housing and transportation costs to exceed 45% of AMI. I mean, it, that if you think about it, that's linking transportation, income, and housing affordability all in one particular goal, but it's a spatial one. But related again to this form and function of what are we trying to do in metropolitan Washington to really, really focus growth in the, in the right places. We took a pledge when we adopted Region 4 that three-fourths of all the future uh, job growth that we measure through commercial construction and half of the re, uh, region's residential growth, um, household growth, would also be in activity centers. So keep in mind, these activity centers, there's 141 of them, it's places like Silver Spring, like Bethesda, like Tyson's, like Largo. Um, they're very, very small. They're only about 9% of the region's land area. So we are focusing the majority of future growth, as you saw in those maps, but more deliberately, we have agreed that is what we want to do. That's where we want to focus growth. And the good news is when we've looked at the actual trends, this was a pledge uh, that we laid out 10 years ago. We're definitely on track with commercial, commercial development, job growth, definitely at 75% there. We're actually doing even better than what we pledge for residential growth. We're at more like 60, 65% of household growth is going into these priority places called activity centers. And that really, as I said, from where I sit, is a very good thing when it comes to 
um, plan and construct. And the last little bullet on here, all of those activity centers, our goal is that they would be served by transit, um, high capacity transit, BRT, metro rail, commuter rail, you know, the, the gamut of things. So I mentioned a couple of uh, minutes ago about our housing targets. Again, we began that journey um, with the, the, the finding from the Amazon folks about housing becoming an economic development impediment. So our board of directors adopted three targets. Here's the first one. We said over the next 10 years, between 2020 and 2030, this region needs to produce 320,000 total, total housing units. And as you can see there, that's 75,000 more total units than what is already being um, anticipated in our growth projections. So they said, we really, really want to lean in. 245,000 wasn't enough. We need 320,000 to really provide workers for the jobs that we believe are coming to this region. Why? To take the pressure off of um, our overburdened transportation system to take the pressure off of our overburdened utilities and really focus in um, to neighborhoods and areas that can support future growth. To go two steps further, the second goal, 75% of all new housing should be in an activity center or near high capacity transit. Again, places where local governments have made the investment in infrastructure where they are hoping to plan for future growth we're saying it's in there, this is what we wanna do. So the board leaned in and they said, we don't want it everywhere. We want the majority of them in these right places. So instead of 50% of housing, they increased it and said 75% of housing. Again, 75% of jobs was already the target. And the last one, and this really is the hardest one, 75% of all the new housing should be affordable to low and middle income households. So let's think about this. First, we're talking from the top level, 50,000 foot level, how much growth and where do we want it? Then we're saying, not only do we want it, we want it in priority places, and we really, really want to do the right thing and focus this and make it affordable to workers across the spectrum. And it's really hard. And this is why I'm gonna point it out. So to hit those targets, this red line, we need to do about 32,000 units a year. 20,000 units over 10 years, that's about what would work out. This blue line below shows you the number of residential permits that are actually being issued. We've been bumping along in the low 20s um, for at least the last two and a half years. It's funny, if you look far off to the left on this slide, 1987, when places like Burke and Chantilly and Gaithersburg Upper were being built out, we were doing more like 40,000 units a year. Why is that important? Because if you take away nothing else from what I say, we are a mature region. And so we are trying to be strategic to think about where can we best focus and accommodate growth. Talked about the housing targets before, but again, here, this is the bad news. We're not hitting them. And every year that we fail to hit this 32,000 number, puts us that much farther behind. So that's, that's you know, a challenge that just continues to grow um, even before the pandemic. So real quickly, and I'll wrap up here in just a minute, um, what about the pandemic? So this, as I said, it's the kind of thing that keeps me awake all night and is part of my job is sort of thinking through what is the future? Because I'm here to tell you, nobody really knows what is the new normal. It's yet to be determined. We lost 100, or I'm sorry, 370, I'm sorry, we have, my screen's in the way here, sorry. We lost 373,000 jobs in one month when the pandemic start, started. 11% uh, of our jobs, it was like the, the, somebody pulled the, the floor out from beneath us. We've clawed our way back. We're about 98, 99% two years into the pandemic. So yes, we've added jobs, but only to get us back to where we were. Another indicator that we track, and again, this relates to economic activity, it, it relates to locational decisions and whatnot. There's a company in Arlington called Castle, and what they do is they provide data, they provide security services to buildings in the, ter in the, the, the form of uh, electronic security cards. So what you're looking at here is in the red line, um, the, the card swipes, if you will, of people going back into their office building from last September all the way up through uh, just two weeks ago. Um, we are below the national average by three or four points, but the bottom line, 
only about 40% of us are going back into the office. So there's benefits to that. You know, the, 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 the traffic system, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, isn't as full, but it starts to beg the question of investments that local governments are making into uh, approving um, commercial office space. If you're only going to be back in the office three days a week, it doesn't take a smart person too long to figure out that maybe if you are in charge of your lease, you might decide you don't need quite as much space. And that has very real fiscal implications. Related to this, and this goes to the heart of locational decisions when it comes to where are people choosing to work in metropolitan Washington in a really expensive housing market. This is from a survey our transportation staff did called Voices of the Region. And what you can see here, and it's not a shock to anybody in this um, forum, two thirds of people said, no, I would really like to telework some days and commute to work you know, occasionally. 9%, less than one out of every 10 said, oh, heck yes, sign me up. I really, really want to go back to work, commute into the office full time forever. Just isn't going to happen. Real quickly, um, you know, I mentioned transportation impacts of COVID. You can see here on the left-hand side how traffic volumes fell at the height, you know, 50% lower um, April of 2020 versus April of 2019. By December of last year, which is what we're looking at over here, traffic was actually back up to about 95, 96% of what it had been in December of 2020 or 2019, rather. So, you know, transportation traffic is coming back, but transit use isn't yet. And when I work for an organization that really, really wants to focus growth in and around transport or transit hubs, this is kind of an important thing to track. This is um, only through February of this year, and I was real pleased to see that Ramada is rolling out um, the new uh, rail cars that they had had problems with, that they're coming back online. But if you look at this, I mean, service is still way below where it had been before. Metro Rail is only at about 30% of what it had been before the pandemic. Metro Bus, and this was a good thing, throughout the pandemic, so many of the essential workers were so dependent on the bus. And so what you can see there is two thirds of Metro Bus riders really, really uh, at pre-pandemic levels. So very quickly, I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, I told you we are focusing in on what are some of these different drivers of future land use investment, future land use planning and growth and investment decisions, the spatial form of where growth is gonna occur. We're obviously gonna look at a range of economic forecasts, what COVID might do in the near term or long term to metropolitan Washington's growth. We're pretty much insulated from really, really bad things through the federal presence. But here's a fun fact, federal uh, civilian employment is pretty much the exact same number of jobs that it was in 1980. What changed was federal spending, federal procurement spending to purchase goods and services went from two to $5 billion in 1980 to $82 billion just a few years ago. And so that is what has driven a lot of our suburban activity centers, what um, I mean, if folks even remember, Joel Garreau wrote a book uh, a while ago about edge cities. That is what drove that type of pattern of growth in metropolitan Washington. We also want to look at potential changes to future average household size, but this second bullet, office and retail space usage. I mentioned it before. If you are teleworking, if you're hot seating, if you are just not coming into the office as much, that puts a, a damper on the need for office space, which means if you have a building and you have a big employer in it, maybe that employer steps back and only needs two thirds as much space. That means you gotta find another employer to backfill the space that used to be occupied by the original tenant. And then lastly, and I alluded to this with the telework, we are working on trying to get a handle on the impact of the timing, location, and the amount of future housing growth. As I said, our housing affordability problem is kind of an Achilles heel from the economic development standpoint. But the corollary to that is, you know, I like to say a job is what you do, it's not where you go. So if you or your partner are only going to the office two or three days, or maybe you might seriously think about looking at a house, a uh, place to live that's 25, 30, maybe 50 miles farther out than you previously were looking into. So that to me, again, is one of those unanswered questions about you know, future growth. 
Then lastly, a couple of other constructs. I talked about you know, that we do look at things from a smart growth lens. Um, for environmental justice on the MPO, the transportation side, we have created and identified, I should say, these 350 census tracts that you see mapped here, we call them equity emphasis areas. It's places, as you see, that have a very high or a higher than regional average concentration of low income and or minority populations. And so why do we do this? Because we wanna make sure we don't fail to invest in these communities, but also we wanna make sure the corollary, we wanna make sure we don't do bad things. Like, you know, we all know from planning school when highways plowed through neighborhoods and just totally destroyed communities. So not that we're in risk of doing anything like that, but it's that same being mindful of doing good and not doing bad. And then lastly, I talked about this before, high capacity transit stations. We have 225 of them. This is a priority for our board. Again, I would argue this is a smart growth construct where the region's transit systems have made billions of dollars investments in the, all of the modes that you see there. And again, these are the metrics where we are trying to focus future growth. Again, 75% of all the future housing and job growth should be located in or around um, any one of these places. So lastly, I'll put in a plug here. And again, I'll put this all in the chat. This is our most recent document that really codifies all of this, where it talks about the fact that prosperity, accessibility, livability, and sustainability, everything's integrated. It's a system. We have climate goals. We have housing. We have transportation goals. And we have equity goals. And they really, really are all linked together. Um, we're very proud of the work and would really commend that to your attention. So. With that, I am going to stop. I hope I got us a little bit back more on track, although I'm looking and seeing um, we're getting close to, to end here. So let me stop and turn it back to Josh. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's fascinating. I'm really glad you brought up the whole um, impacts of, of, of telecommuting uh, piece because, you know, it's, it's something that concerns me too. And I didn't mention it during my talk, but, you know, all the efforts we do to try to, um, keep jobs and, and housing within the city centers and around, right? And you, it makes you wonder, is, 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 the, is there going to be a trend that undermines that now with the uh, wider acceptance of telecommuting and more and more of it happening? People can now change their decision making and say, oh, I'm just going to move further away because I can now. So it, it's, it's definitely something that, you know, we don't have a handle on yet. And, and we certainly need to keep that as part of the conversation. So um, I want to give a huge thank you to all, all of my fellow panelists. We don't have a lot of time for questions. Um, the good news is we've been, we've been answering questions live in the Q&A, and I don't see any that are open uh, and unanswered there. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, but I guess uh, one quick thing is if we could have a, you know, a couple seconds, uh, if anybody has any thoughts on, on this. One of the questions um, Laura asked is, you know, do any of the panelists have any device, uh, any Advice, have any advice about um, how they can make connections between smart growth and water quality, that planning and, and water quality link. So certainly, um, you know, within the next uh, couple of seconds, if you had any thoughts on that. I'll just jump somebody? in really quick and just say that's a tough one to, to, to tackle. And mm -hmm. we as a regional entity try our best. Oftentimes things like resilience tend to bring a lot of those groups together. So um, um, having having more discussions uh, holistically. Yeah, and I think just any any type of um, you know professional groups you can join. I know um, I know there's the uh, Resilient and Sustainable Communities League known as Rascal. In, in Delaware that, you know, has definitely um, increased my knowledge of, you know, uh, resiliency and environmental um, best practices and things in the state. So, I, so yeah, definitely, you know, any, any of those kind of connections you can make. Well, would, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jen. I was just gonna say, I would recommend if, if you're interested in making those connections um, as a land use planner, take advantage of opportunities that your um, DEQ or DNR uh, agencies may provide and, and any kind of organizations like, um, uh, you know, like what we have here, whether it be our, our PTAC group or uh, planner technical advisory committees, things like that, um, take advantage of getting involved or listening into those sessions um, to, to get, you know, be up, more up to date on um, those issues. 
Thank you for that. Um, oh, Ed, sure. So for Laurel, Delaware, the connection between healthy water quality and the ecological integrity of its broad key, creek is, is key to its future, to the economic development that it wishes. It's trying to position itself as a base camp to Nantico country, the Nantico being the river that drains the Chesapeake Bay. So highlighting that water quality is seen as something that might attract people to the town of Laurel to engage in those types of recreational activities. Thank you, Ed. Build off what Ed said, I think um, something that we've tried to be mindful of is, is those local connections. So for us here in Delaware, as a headwater state to the Chesapeake, many of the residents don't necessarily feel that connection that the folks in Maryland or Virginia may. So making connections to local water bodies um, you know, at, the, at the local level and, and highlighting the issues, the local issues, I think is critical. Fantastic. Well, I think I'm getting the, the look from Laura, like we need to wrap it up. So we're going to let, uh, I'm going to turn it back over. Um, but, I, you know, the last thing I'll say just on behalf of the Delaware chapter, just thank you. Um, thank you on behalf of the, uh, the collaboration too. And I just want to say, obviously, this is being recorded. Um, I'm happy we were able to answer most of the questions, but please reach out to us if you have anything further. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. So we just, as usual, we have a lot of resources that will be posted up on the uh, the Virginia APA website. And um, I want to turn it over to Laura cattell Knoll to close us out. Thank you, Laura Backel. Um, so as Laura mentioned, this is the last in a series of six webinars that were around planning for clean water. And so we have a few partners I just wanna thank really quickly uh, before we end today. I wanna to thank EPA and the Chesapeake Bay Program who helped to fund this series and the Chesapeake Bay Trust who helped to administer the contract to do this work. Um, and then of course, our key partners in the project. Um, we had a small steering committee for this work, which included members of the local leadership work group and the local government advisory committee. Um, you've already heard Josh sing the praises of the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration, which has been just a phenomenal partner, including all the state chapters. Um, Delaware was today's host, but we had a host from um, each of the other states for the other webinars, which was really amazing um, to see um, folks take that kind of ownership around it. So thank you to the Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, National Capital, Pennsylvania, and of course, Delaware chapters for helping to host. Um, and a special shout out to the Virginia chapter um, who helped to run the tech. So thank you, um, Martina and Jillian um, for their work in the background, that's essential. Um, I also wanna thank our speakers today, but also all the speakers from the whole series. I think we had more than 20 um, experts speaking <laughs> uh, through this series of six webinars, which was really amazing and fascinating. Um, thank you to our attendees, the ones in attendance today and previous. Um, events. And then lastly, thank you to Laura Backel from ERG, who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes um, to make this series happen. Um, so thank you all. Um, hopefully that was quick and painless. Um, but you know, this work can't be done without partners. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.